Uh, welcome back. We've got uh, JF and Magdalena with us in the studio to answer some questions. I really enjoyed that, that talk. I thought it was really, really great. Um, I have a question straight up, actually. Um, like you said, accessibility is a very daunting area for many businesses. Uh, what do you find is the most challenging thing around changing the way that companies think about accessibility? Yeah, go for it, JF. <laughs> But well, clearly there are, there are challenges and, and, and I've experienced uh, in the past um, kind of resistance and I know that a lot of people feel frustrated when they do experience resistance. But I want to focus on what we can do because there's so much more we can do than sometimes we realize. So as, as, as I explained just before, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this and I absolutely believe that the main reasons we make accessibility mistakes is not because of a lack of time and money, it's because of a lack of knowledge. I, I know I simplify a little bit here, but my point here is that there's not, they, for most of us, I believe, well, I'll speak about me. In my case, there was nothing that was preventing me from spending an hour learning a little bit more about accessibility, learning to avoid a specific design mistake or learning to avoid a specific coding mistake. And as soon as I learn, you know, to, to avoid one, one mistake, then um, I had a lot of influence on people around me and I could do a bit more of that every day. And I believe that a lot of us can do that often. And there's, then there's uh, so much less resistance. So, so to my, my counter attack to resistance is to just learn something and share my knowledge. And, and a lot of us can do that. And my second counter attack to resistance is to talk about things concretely. So for example, if, we, if a business might say, oh, we don't have time for accessibility, that's quite abstract. But if you say, hey, um, hey, on this page, um, the, all the focus indicators are disabled. So people can't use the site with a keyboard. And um, like, it's literally because someone added a line of CSS that's a very bad practice. Can we remove that? Then the conversation is completely different. Uh, no, that makes total sense. And, and kind of linking in from that, there's a question from Neil Parker um, about, you know, how important it is to, you know, embed accessibility from the very start. How did you go about convincing uh, your leadership team or, or how do we go about convincing those leadership teams? Because to spend that, you know, a little bit of extra sort of development time, how do you change that mindset? Is it about practical examples? Magdalena, perhaps you could have a go answering that one. Oh, you know what? That was such a great question for JF. <laughs> <laughs> From, because from an engineering perspective, which is um, where where JF's forte is, I loved him to answer that. With if you want to jump in, yeah, absolutely, do it. So the question is how to convince people to invest a bit of time. Yeah, and, and and that leadership team, and how do you convince people? There's lots you can do. I mean, so the, the most effective stuff you can do is to do usability testing with a wide range of people and to show videos of people struggling mm. to use interfaces that the designers and leadership team thought were easy to use. That's the most useful thing probably. Uh, use it, doing user testing often is very, is very possible. But again, I'd like to flip that, that question a little bit. You don't need permission mm. to, um, to be careful not to unnecessarily avoid people. If anything, I would say you need permission to not care. I mean, legally, a company is required under the Equality Act to, um, to make reasonable accommodation to avoid indirect discriminations against employees and against customers. So if an, and, 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 the, and business can't say, oh, it would have been easy three months ago, but now it's too late to do it after the fact. No, it needs to be proactive in the law. It needs to be, you have to do proactive, reasonable accommodations. So as a designer or as a developer, as a product manager, you don't need anyone's permission to proactively be reasonably careful uh, to avoid those things. If one of you has said, you need permission to not do it. Magdalena, yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in there as well. I feel like a lot of these, a lot of the questions that come up, the best answer is evidence um, and exposure. And I think, Leading back to your first question, one of the biggest challenges is actually getting access to a diverse range of people to hear their voices. 
Um, and it's so easy in an organization or anywhere to just live in your bubble, live in the knowledge that you have, um, whether that's design or engineering, and just keep building on top of that. But you're only going to break out of that bubble is by talking to people who have different needs or who experience the world in a different way. And no one can argue the ev evidence. So if someone's saying, oh, we're not going to invest in that, and then here you go, here's a user who's saying, hey, for Kuth, where is my post? I can't find it. And now I'm just going to use a different service. You know, our stakeholders don't want to hear that. And they'll say, oh, no, let's let's accommodate that. And I find that's just it's it's the it's the voice of the user that kind of convinces everyone, which makes my job a lot easier. Brilliant. Um, I was going to say off the back of that, we actually have a question. Um, are there any studies around the amount of lost revenue due to the exclusion of accessibility features that you guys have come across or resources that you could use? Yeah, definitely. Just to jump in here, actually, um, abilitynet.org.uk is a really great resource for, for information like this. Um, something that I came across recently from them, an article in 2020, was talking about online sales in the UK, um, losing out on up to 17 billion pounds a year wow. by creating wow. websites that are, that are inaccessible. And some of the stats that they were talking about was something like 70% of users with impairments will click away within a few seconds of entering a website. And they tend to use sites that they know are accessible, which may mean that they'll actually pay more for a product from a service that provides an accessible experience than from a service that will provide the same product, but cheaper. So yes, there, there's a lot of stuff out there. And I'd say just dig out Google, but go head over to AbilityNet for some concrete resources. Fantastic. And um, yeah, and do please put that link in the chat uh, after this as well. That would be uh, really useful. Um, and actually, uh, it's, it's, you know, everyone can relate to that issue of, you know, you know pop-ups. I mean, the G7 summit yesterday, that was the, the question that the, the UK minister was putting about, can we have global consensus around uh, pop-ups? You know, that is something that everyone experiences and, has, and, and reacts to in different ways. And uh, it's all about accessibility, isn't it? It's, it's not about putting it over here. It is the, you know, it's, it's, it's every user uh, will come across this in different ways. Um, so another question from Calvin Robbins, uh, really great talk. Do you use or recommend any automation tools, code scanning, linting rules, E2E testing that help highlight accessibility issues? Yeah, for sure. So the main thing to, to know about this is that so there are tools that will automatically detect some accessibility issues, but those are great, but they will only detect about 30% of the issues that are covered in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines level AA. Mm. And as I mentioned earlier, those Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are also incomplete. So my point is automated tools are great, but manual testing is absolutely essential. And uh, it's really great to learn how to use screen readers, assistive technologies for your own uh, quality insurance and testing. It's, it's, it's so great and so helpful. But to answer your question directly, um, the, 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 one of the best ones is called AXE, A -X -E, by a company called DQ. Um, you can get it for free. And uh, it's focusing on avoiding false positives. So if it tells you there is an error, it's probably there is an error. And you can use that tool. Literally, you can run it on a web page manually, or, create, or you can read it as part, of a user, as part of your unit test in code using just AXE, for example or you can run it as part of your integration tests using Cypress Axe, for example, and it's great. Fantastic. Oh, there are lots more, actually. There's <laughs> another tool I recommend called Microsoft Accessibility Insights. It's a browser extension. And so you open a web page and you start that browser extension, and it will guide you through a full audit of that page that's very, very comprehensive. And um, it's really helpful if you don't yet know the web content set of the guidelines. Brilliant. Um, I've got another question uh, for myself. So you've highlighted how small changes make big impact um, to users. Are there any specific pillars of success or metrics that you guys specifically are working towards? Oh, there's a lot of thought going on there. <laughs> Who wants to answer that? <laughs> Hard questions. Yeah, yeah, Philip is good. <laughs> That's one of the easier ones. <laughs> 
I mean, I think where we're at right now is addressing known issues that exist in the experience and that those known issues are either through our own knowledge or through consistent feedback that we're getting um, in the experience. So I think if we can sort of raise our, our current experience to sort of a baseline that we're happy with addressing some of these known issues, I think that's uh, a measure of success for us at the moment. We, as we move forward and we're hoping to, well, hoping, we are in the midst of redesigning our visual language and how we, um, and, and the experience of our platforms. And all of that is going to be done through the lens of accessibility. So that means the typefaces we use, the colors that we use. A lot, a lot of that stuff has been almost retrofitted into the platform. So kind of like JF was talking about earlier, you know, you want to make this stuff from the beginning, but when you inherit legacy um, systems, a lot of them don't come with that. So a lot of the work we've been doing now is actually, yeah, putting some plasters on things like that. But as we move forward, we really want to make sure we're baking that in from the beginning. And we've already started doing that. So yeah, I can't give you a number or some a time and a date, but yeah, it's more about those known issues and addressing those so that we can build on top of them for a su successful experience. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, we've got time for one last question. Uh, so this is from Tom. He said, is your accessible component library open source or can you recommend any similar open source libraries that would be a good starting point? Go for it, JF. Thanks for asking. It's not yet open source. I would love for it to be open source. Uh, I believe it'll happen. Um, there are, um, so when we, before we build that component library, we did some research to try and find, well, could we just use something completely off the shelf? Mm -hmm. And for sure, you will find component libraries that are fully accessible. But we didn't find any at the time that also corresponded to the technology that we use. And also just, so for example, some of the best ones that we knew about were the GDS design system component library, but we don't build websites the same way. Or we had the Australian government uh, design system that some of the way that we would have needed to use that didn't quite work for us. Um, beyond that, you also have other component libraries that are really good, but quite quite too small for us. So, but they are very good for inspiration. So, uh, Turnon UI, Turnon is a consultancy in the US for accessibility, and they have a, a, a library called Turnon UI, T E N O N U I, and I've like studied that a lot. Or uh, there's Reach UI, R E A C H UI. Um, that's probably actually the best example. Um, beyond that, yeah, the BBC also has uh, the Global Experience Language that's got a lot of good tools for accessibility, and some of it is coded and it's worth looking up. Nice. Thank you very much for, for joining us. It's been great to have you in the studio, and thank you for a fantastic talk. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, um, I think now we're going to um, have a bit of a break uh, in the main stage area. Uh, and we'll be back here at 12.15 to introduce our next uh, speaker. But yeah, thanks again, JF and Magdalena. That was a brilliant topic set out and explained so well. Uh, I think everyone's learned everything. Uh, you know, everyone's come a long way in, in, a, in a journey just in that short space of time. And do the, the comments, keep them coming. And people are putting resources in the chat and links and everything, which is fantastic. So uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. And we'll see you back here at uh, quarter past 12, everyone.